Jason Richardson, welcome to the Riff Hard Podcast again. How many times is this? Uh, like five now, maybe four. I think I think so. Um, and for people who are wondering why we're doing this after we just did the episode with Jason and Mike, uh, a bunch of questions came in from readers. Readers, who the fuck reads a podcast? A bunch of questions came in from listeners and viewers for you and it just didn't seem organic to ask those questions in the episode with mike it just it wasn't it just didn't fit the conversation it would have just been a weird left turn so um thank you for coming on to answer these because it's a it's a good number of questions nice that's Um, sick so let's get into it so uh Christopher Jordan Boyd says, you're one of the best players in the game, and I've noticed you always have some cool opportunities you're taking part in. Do you have any suggestions for players on how to keep an eye out for opportunities that might be worth trying? Hmm. Well, that's what got me where I'm where I am right now. Uh, was Looking a, out for a, opportunities? A, yeah, a MySpace yeah. bulletin you remember those and i know you remember those maybe not everyone listening does but that all shot parish ad um back when i was in high school was i was actually i was at my band practice like my local band and the other guitar player was like yeah they posted an ad for one you should send one in just like not expecting a response back and then i did so here i am now and that wouldn't have happened if i hadn't seen that and that was literally just a post kind of like similar what the smashing pumpkins just did if that makes sense like that's a good like analogy of it like they posted like hey we need a new guitar player and a bunch of people sent stuff in you know we did something like that with jens bogren um he needed a new engineer at his mm-hmm. studio and he wanted somebody vetted through the urm community so we literally ran his his engineer search through urm mm-hmm. and he got a ton of a ton of people trying out but yeah someone got the job someone from the community got the job moved to sweden and now is like working over there at fascination street i mean i feel like you have to i i feel like really like i connect a lot with this question just because i feel like my life too has been a matter of seeing an opportunity and jumping on it but Mm -hmm. like i feel like you just have to you have to be in that kind of mindset of like looking for them and when you see one like when you see one just take a chance yeah take a chance yeah exactly everything else though has kind of been like uh kind of just happened like through growing on my own from that initial point um like i was jo- asked to join all the remains um even same thing with boo like when i was in all parish i filled in for them and then they asked afterwards and then chelsea grin was just a byproduct of getting kicked out of them and because they had just lost their guitar player like within like a month or two of me getting kicked out and we were all really good friends so it just ended up happening like i was literally just randomly said i was venting to uh, dan about getting kicked out and then i just randomly said you should let me join your band and he called me back like four hours later and then i was going to europe with them um but everything else like uh like even like writing the following reverse song um Luke's their drummer. So he just, Ronnie just ended up, you know, hearing more and more of our stuff. And then the conversation mm-hmm. just got brought up and then we did it. And it just ended up happening. Like it, just being a good person too, like easy to get along with, easy to hang out with, easy to work with is like almost more important than being, well, you need to be good at your craft, but yeah, if you're not good to hang out with or like converse with, then no one's going to want to work with you ever. Yeah, I feel like I'm thinking back to like we've been friends now for how long? What, like twelve years now? Yeah, since um, the Evolve EP, which came out in 2012. Yeah, so uh, before then. Yeah, it's it's a long time, and all of my music industry relationships that the people who are friends, but that you also that's what's interesting about music is you do work with people that are friends of yours um it's this like parallel kind of relationship people work together and they hang out together Mm -hmm. um i mean 
or hang out on the internet because be, oftentimes people never see each other. Yeah. Um, but like, <clears throat> usually people work with their friends. I think that's a big part of it too, is you meet people through friends uh, and, you know, they introduce you to people and through having friends and a good reputation, I feel like that that's, uh, that's what makes things come together. And then there's also the whole aspect of, you know, people say that luck is uh, preparation. Yes. Preparation and meets opportunity. So when you had opportunities come up, the level of skill you had on guitar and preparation that you did made you be able to take advantage of those opportunities. One thing led to the next, to the yeah, next, to the next. It. Yeah, I, I feel like you're the perfect example of like, of that, of the luck equals preparation plus but, opportunity. Yeah, right place, right time, unfortunately, does have a lot to do with stuff in this industry as well. Yeah, but you can be right place, right time. Yeah several times and not even realize it if you're not prepared for it yep definitely yeah. some, definitely truth to that i haven't thought about it exactly like that but you're you're correct 100 percent. like if you're not ready for it when it happens then it's gonna go to someone else oops <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it, it, exactly so mm -hmm. i would say to to christopher is to put himself out there as much as possible um, and try to make some friends. It sounds like really like simple advice, but like for real, man, like I just think about, you know, what's the biggest thing Riff Hart has done is we did a course with Zach Wild. That's mm -hmm. the biggest thing. I've known Blasco since OzFest 2007. Like we've been buddies since back then. It's kind of these, my my relationships the stuff that like is most fruitful are relationships that i've had for a long fucking time and yep. it didn't you know it, it, it we did not start the relationship as trying to work together he just happened to be the dude and you know the dude that played bass in the headlining band on that tour yeah and <laughs> yeah it, he's so, done a lot dude yeah he's he's done a lot but he also he's like friends with everybody Mm -hmm. He tries a bunch of stuff. Some of it doesn't work. A lot of it does work, but he's always got like something new happening yep. and he's, he's not afraid to fail, which I think is a big part of it. Like you always, I, there's been several Blasco projects I know of that he told me about that he was starting that just never went anywhere. But then there's been several others that have been fucking big. Yep. So when some lose some. Always lose happens. Some, lose some. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Zach Seif says, how do you organize slash decide which riffs are for your solo project versus all that remains? Uh, well, that kind of starts from inception. Like I automatically know what I'm writing for. It's not like I don't just have like a backlog or like a catalog or like, <laughs> like, you know, folders upon folders of unused stuff. Almost everything I write gets used. I would say like 95% of everything I write gets used for something. I don't just have like a bunch of like half-assed riffs just sitting around just to like shit something out. You know what I mean? That's a waste of my time, in my opinion. Um, it's like if I'm going to work it on something and write it, like it's going to get used for something. I'm not just going to sit up here crapping out riffs just to force something out because then it sounds forced. Like if you're just like trying to pump out stuff constantly then it's going to sound like that you know what i mean so i'm fascinated by your answer actually mm -hmm. because uh so okay so first of all so you sit down to write for something specific that you're doing for first and foremost right now yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah i i relate to that a lot like uh i've talked about this with my girlfriend a lot she paints uh guitars for uh the fender custom shop which is really oh, good nice. Um, like custom guitars and mm -hmm. people are always like, do you ever just paint for fun or like just do other stuff? She's like, no, like it, it's always <laughs> for like some, it has to be for some, for something real. Like it has to be, uh, the custom shop has to request it, mm -hmm. um, for her to do it. She doesn't just hobby it out. 
Yeah. yeah. I feel the same way with like everything I do is like for a specific purpose. So I, I find that interesting, but what I wonder about is, okay, so you use 95% of everything you write. Does that mean that you don't write shit or does that mean that you delete the shit you very quickly realize something? Well, that's isn't... part of the process. You know okay. what I mean? Yeah. It's like, like I'm working on another thing right now. I can't say uh, what it's for, but I obsessed over it for like a week straight. And then I told him, I was like, I got pumped the brakes. Like I've been like so deep in this, like the only thing I've been listening to like at all for like a week straight now. And it's coming out sick. It's coming out really good, but I just needed like a breather, you know, like a reset because mm -hmm. yep. you start to like not be able to hear it like objectively or as objectively. Um, and you don't like get newer or different ideas. Like, so taking a step back, if you have the time to, like, that's the other thing. It's like, if you don't have like a hard deadline or anything like that, like I've always found if I can take like a week or two, if not longer, uh, off from that one specific thing, like coming back to it with like a fresh set of years and like thought process, like your brain isn't fucking smooth from just slaving over it anymore. Um, that's when I end up coming with some of my best stuff just cause it's like a literally like a reset. Like you have like a new take on it and you're not just hearing it the same way you were when you were just in it for like weeks or for like a week straight where it's the only thing you've been working on. You know, a lot of times people don't have that opportunity because like, you know, label deadlines and like strict studio time and like all that mm. stuff and just like just got to get it done you just got to get it done and like a lot of times songs suffer because of that and that's another reason why like every song in this new all the remains album is like in my opinion like it for what it's supposed to be for what the one song each song independently what it's supposed to be is like a 10 out of 10 in my opinion like we're having trouble like picking singles because we're like they're all so like each one could be a single in its own right it just depends on if you want it to be like more radio like you know catchier that kind of like vibe or like stupid heavy because there's both but they're all really good and all very catchy in their own right it's a good problem to have where you're like Fuck, it's a great problem which which one do we release like usually you know there's always like one or two where you're like those are the ones and we're just like scratching our heads like which one do we put out <laughs> Th that's <laughs> that's awesome it, especially for the type of band that all that remains is like mm -hmm. that is that I would imagine that that would be the goal. It, I mean, obviously, ri obviously writing a killer record, but that killer record is going towards a specific audience that yep. consumes it a specific way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like I would never to further like you know answer his question. How do I decide? It's like I, I would never write like you know like tendonitis or hose down for all that remains like ever. Like you can't do that. <laughs> that's not a good business decision it was like the same thing when i came into chelsea grin it's like there's already like you know a couple albums and like fan base you know that's they're expecting to hear like a certain type of metal and i can't just come in and like you know completely change what this fan base that's been built is you know accustomed to like you can you know branch out a little bit but you got to think about it a little bit more business wise i've actually found like recently since i've been doing stuff for other people a little bit more including like technically all that remains even though i'm in the band it's but it's like you know nine albums two platinum singles golds like there's a very clear sound that you know needs to come from all the remains and i can't just change that that's stupid yeah that would not I, be wise at all it, dude, with bringing doth back um he, definitely obviously not the biggest band in history or anything but we've had fans that have stuck with it for you know through the mm. entire hiatus and in bringing it back it was really important to make sure that people who have been waiting all this time could listen to it and know that it's us and it check off all the boxes for why they love us and so there were there's very specific things elements that have to be in there and yep. so and then mission accomplished like the old school fans uh a, a lot of them think it's our best record uh and all of them say that it like fits the trajectory perfectly um that it's what they were waiting for but there was a lot of conscious effort to make sure that it, without pandering or anything it's all mm -hmm. organically written but like 
without pandering, but just to make sure that you're checking off those boxes for for your fans. Yep. Yeah, that was the intent. That's what I did with Divine when I wrote that one. That one's one of mine. Um, and that was my goal. Like I wanted it to sound like it could have come off the fall of ideals. Like mm-hmm. that's l- exactly what I wanted. And then like when it came out and seeing everyone's comments, they're like, oh, this sounds like it's straight from 2006, like that era. I was like, perfect. Like, perfect. Mission accomplished. Yeah. It's like, he- hell yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want I wanted Doth fans to say this sounds like the hinderers and the concealers put together, but modern and like, but modern. Yeah, that that's what I want, and that's exactly if you go through all the comments and stuff, that's basically what people keep saying. It's like the hinderers, but modern, or the concealers, but modern, the hinderers plus the concealers, but modern. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think that for people who are you know deciding what to do with their music. Is I think that kind of goes back to what we were saying before of writing for something specific. Yeah, like that, like Divine, and just to have another example, um, like I, so my thought process for all the All It Remains stuff, because, you know, I had to have like a goal in mind. I can't just like, you know, write my own stuff for it. It has to sound like All It Remains. So I would specifically take like two songs from the uh, that era that I liked a lot and then try to consciously keep in mind like elements from both those songs. And then it's like for divine, for example, I picked this calling and not alone. It was like, how can I hybrid these two songs from the fall of ideals, like in a modern way with my own twist on it. And that's what ended up coming out. I'd also just relearned a bunch of children of Bodum at the time too. I had just gotten my Alexa mm-hmm. ESP. So I was kind of like in that, uh, thought process as well. You know, that's from the, they were in their prime around that same era. So it all kind of like ended up blending together. And that's how I thought about that one. And then let you go. That was another, that's another one of mine. And, um, I, we needed another drop C song. So, so, you know, when you're playing it live, you don't have to play one song, switch guitars Mm -hmm. just just for for one song kind of kills moment momentum in the set. Um, so we needed at least one more song that was in drop C. So I ended up writing, let you go. And uh, I had actually taken, um, I had, for whatever reason, I got on an electric cowboy kick <laughs> just because they're super fun and like they're actually really sick. Like, it's obviously a joke. Like, take it, like, yeah, clearly, like, they're just trying to have fun while writing, like, you know, catching music at the same time. But it's like, you got to take it for what it is. Like, and what it is is done very well. So, I had just been listening to them and like some of the riffs. I was like, wow, there's something to that, like that really driving, like fast four on the floor, like riffs that they do. So I was like, I'm gonna try something like that out. And then I had a Celine Dion song pulled up the reference for structure. I'm not even kidding. Like pre-pro name for that song was electric Dion. <clears throat> and that's why there's the key change at the end too. Like, you know, that old, uh, Max Martin, like Dr. Luke, like a uh, pop structure trick that, it was all over the place in like nineties pop, like backstreet and sync, like all oh, that and stuff. it works too. Yep. So that's how I'll let you go end up being. <clears throat> I mean, it's <laughs> I, I love that. I love that because mm-hmm. um it's you should be able to recognize great things about any any genre of music. I feel like even if you're not a fan of the genre, like mm-hmm. uh there's a few genres that make me fucking insane to where I just, you, if you put me in a room with it, you may as well be waterboarding me, but <laughs> like I fucking hate country, but Fair, country, there's some that I like, but I'm not like putting it on all the time. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, you, 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 I'll, I'll give it, I'll give you, if someone like gifts me that country, I'll gift it over to you. So, <laughs> um, but but I feel like within the range of shit you can stand, mm-hmm. there's you can borrow stuff from so many genres, and I think that that's part of what helps give people a unique identity is to take things that aren't common in your home genre. Mm-hmm. Like, do you do you hate Rascal Flats? Well, well, not hate, but it's like if they came on, is that one of the ones where you're like, no, it nails does on not... chalkboard, or can you? No, no, that? no, no, no. It's it's more like definitely not going like to be cookie cutter stuff. It's, yeah, yeah. And Rascal yeah. Flats is not going to be like even my fifteenth choice of what to listen to or thirtieth. 
Yeah, that's but, fine. Yeah. Yeah, but but it won't yeah, it won't make me want to like jump out a window. Yeah, because those dudes that, got pipes. Like they're like yeah. they're up there. My friend Andy plays guitar for them too, and he's um replaced guitar for them live and he's a monster. Andy Wood. Okay, so that's the thing that you can appreciate about country, even if mm-hmm. you don't like it, is the level of I like some of it. It's musicianship. very few and far between. But there every now and then something comes on and I'm just like, I that's really catchy. Or like just that's really well written. It's not just about like barbecue stands on t-shirts or tailgating. <laughs> and it's like actually like got a little bit of substance to it, you know. And those are the ones that always do better. Like what hurts yeah. the most by Rascal Frats. Rascal Rascal Frats. Rascal Flats is a incredible song. Like that's an incredibly well written song and insanely catchy. Like start to finish. Everything about that song is just like Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Done and, insanely well. And if you want to talk about musicianship like right. some of the best players on the planet are well, in dude, that I was scene. a usher at this uh, amphitheater called Nissan Pavilion. And um, it's called Jiffy Loop now, I think. Jiffy Loop Pavilion out in Virginia um, when I was in high school. And one of the sh- concerts was Rascal Flats. Like this was forever ago, obviously, like late 2000s. And I remember they gave everyone a moment in the band to just go off and like just the drummer started doing all this like crazy ass double kick and like just yep. going completely ham and the violin player started playing like Ingve shit. Like I was like, why don't you guys let them do that more? That cause I was, you know, learning Dream Theater, Children of mm-hmm. um, Necrophagist, Faceless, like all this like every like the Sumerian stuff, all that stuff back then. And so when that ca- happened, I was like why don't you guys let them do that like more often? And I was like, <laughs> now I understand why. But back then I was just like, I wanted, I just wanted to go fast. So <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, respect. Like those dudes definitely, they, they have it in them. That's for sure. So speaking <clears throat> of playing fast, we have a question from Mark Miller. It says, do you still do guitar exercises at your level? Um, and which exercise do you believe helped you improve the most? I mean, there's probably some other exercises I could learn now. I don't know what they are. I would have to find them. But for the most part, like, I would say now it's just kind of like since I've reached like a certain point with my technique, it's just maintenance. Like as long as I'm just playing my songs or like the exercises that I would play or like still teach people and stuff, um, I'm able to maintain my technique. Um, But it always takes like I'm like I'm in the process right now of building my chops back up to where I can play my own songs comfortably. Like, cause there's definitely a level, a difference between like struggling and then like actually being able to, you know, play the song, start to finish and be like, all right, like that was, that was fine. And my hands don't feel like they're drooling. Um, yeah. and then same for like, we're about to do like all our mains about to do a two month tour. Like fortunately we're only playing like a shorter, shorter set since we're one of three, but still, you know, adrenaline live and all that stuff kicks in you fit, gas yourself out like for harder than you would usually do just sitting in like you know sitting right here practicing mm-hmm. so i'm in the process of just getting my stuff back up to a point where there are my chops back up to where it's like comfortable to play all that stuff and i'm not going to be you know like burning by the by the end of the song because uh, i'm not just up here playing 250 bpm 16th notes all the time <laughs> like that's just stupid like it would be, just dan- hurt. be dangerous. Yes. Yeah. I'd end up just ruining my arms. So there's a fine line between overdoing it and like actually just like maintaining your technique. You know, it's like bodybuilders, professional bodybuilders, you know, they have their on season and off season. Yep. And the off season, I mean, they, uh, they don't look like they do in those contests. Absolutely. During the not. off season. No, nope. they, <laughs> I mean, they're still athletes, mm-hmm. but a lot of them will put on like 20 pounds of fat and like 25 or 30 pounds of oh, fat. Yeah. Like the, they will work out a lot less. They'll still work out, mm-hmm. but we're not talking like real, like four months straight of contest prep where yep. every fucking gram of food is counted and everything is measured. And it's like, mm-hmm. And I feel like playing battle, it's a similar thing. Like every, every sick player I know, uh, who 
has gotten to the professional level has time periods where they are like prepping for a thing and it could be a month, two months, three months, whatever it is, where they are just like technique, technique, technique. Yeah. But then they stop because you can't, you can't do that forever. You will actually hurt yourself. Yep. Yep. So that's like, yeah, like if I'm, you know, you guys know, everyone listening knows how like writing goes and stuff, especially now with like modern tools, it's like a lot of start and stop and like put the guitar down, pick it back up, edit something, mm -hmm. mess around with it, tinker around with like another idea and then, you know, punch ins and all of that kind of stuff. So it's like, I mean, you know, hopefully you can get most of the part like in one cohesive take, you know, that's the obvious goal. Uh, doesn't always end up happening that way, but uh, so I'm, I'm not just like up here, just like slaving, trying to like maintain the, me being able to play these songs, like at all times, like it's, there's peaks and valleys with it for sure. Dude, it's a big ask if to be able to play that kind of stuff when you're writing it at like, at like performance level, that's a, oh, dude, I'm so lazy dude, that <laughs> when is it a, comes that, to writing. That's a, that's a crazy <laughs> ask. The idea and like concept of yeah. the song is more important to me than like my pride and being able to say like yeah i fucking tracked that like right away right when i wrote it it's like no it just came out perfect because i am god's yeah gift. <laughs> yeah, yeah no that does not happen no i definitely use tools to my advantage to help get the idea out efficiently and then i worry about being able to like perform it for full speed later once i actually have a you know good amount of time to practice whatever this crazy idea is that i just came up with yeah, Sometimes I'll even sense. test it out in Guitar Pro too to see if it's even worth practicing. Yeah, <laughs> wise, very yep. wise. <clears throat> so question from Fran to check, which is, uh, your music is incredibly dense when it comes to number of instruments. How do you decide what takes center stage in parts and what's a background element? Um, I don't even know if I can answer that. That's so subjective. Uh, that's the thing. Like with, uh, you just got trial and error and see what see what happens. But obviously, there are some defaults though. You know, like like an ambient texture or something like that. Like shouldn't be like if it's a full band moment, you shouldn't that shouldn't be like up in front. But the second I just said that though, something popped in my head to where a scenario where that could be the case where it's like yes. it's like an an interlude or something or like a lull. Like right after it, like, I don't know, maybe the whole band goes lo-fi and then this ambient sound like is more in the forefront as like a transition yeah. or something like that. See, there's like overtakes, the, overtakes the band as an effect. Yeah. Like see, there's, there's no right or wrong answer to any of that, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Every time someone asks me about writing, I don't know how to fucking answer it every single but time. But that is a great answer though. Uh, that is a great answer that um, it seems to me like there's a lot of intentionality with your writing mm -hmm. um and you've done so much of it that uh, i'm i figure that you are tinkering a lot but you also oh, yeah. there's probably some like goal in your mind even if it's not fully formed there's like you know you like know it i'm and i'm just guessing cuz i've never watched you write but i'm guessing that you kind of even if you don't totally know it 100 percent written in your head like you'll know it when you find it and it's a very specific thing oh yeah usually if i'm not getting chills at some point during the writing process it's not good enough that's kind of a rule yeah. for myself like there has to be a moment where i'm like punching the air like freaking out excited like be it like in the moment writing or if i've from pacing with my airpods in you know referencing it like after I've stopped for the day and I just can't stop listening to it. That's another good sign. Like if I don't want to mm -hmm. stop listening to it, like I like, like there's sometimes people say like, Oh, I hate that thing I wrote, you know, like even if it's like, I can understand if it's like, you know, 20 years ago or something like that, but even still like bigger artists, like those are still some of their bigger, the, their biggest songs. Even look at all their mains, like follow ideals, overcome like all of that stuff. Like that's pushing 20 years. Um, now, and a lot of people think that's yeah. the best shit that the band has written. So I, my first it, album's almost 10 years old, which is fucked up to think about. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> but it, you, huh. you should, I feel like you shouldn't dog your old music just because. No, definitely uh, not. I'm yeah, not. Especially, it's yeah. not, I don't mean you. I just mean in, like a general kind of you. 
Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I understand if people are talking about like their first songs they ever wrote or something. They might or their high cam eight track recordings. Yeah, sure. If, <laughs> if they're talking about that, but I feel like if they've been serious and like going at it, like for real for a long time, it, then that means that 10 years ago or 20 years ago, they were still serious and they were still good. Mm -hmm. And, the, and mu music is timeless. So yep. Just because you had a good idea 20 years ago doesn't mean it's not relevant anymore. Yep, 100%. <clears throat> Col Colton Chapman says, it would really be cool to find out how his relationship with Japan came about. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what back. he means by that. Me either. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of thinking back to like maybe the first time that I went over there uh, with my solo project. Um, I think we just got asked by because polyphia was going over there for headliners and we had just gotten off um we were already on tour with them at the time in 2017 on the lit af tour um my first album with luke had just come out so we had done that tour together already and i think it just kind of made sense at the time to just go over there with them when they had their shows if i remember correctly and then i met and got in touch with um my friend kenji who's kind of like a uh, best way to put like a manager, a manager for Japan only. If that makes sense. He like helped me get yeah. my the new album licensed out there, and then that dude that owns that label, Trooper Entertainment, um, Tetsu. He you know has connections with Creative Man, which is the biggest promoter company in Japan. They do like all the festivals and stuff like that over there. So that's how we got on Loud Park that year was through them. Um, but. Other than that, though, I'm kind of blanking on the exact thing that it was. But since you know, since that one, since those few club shows with Polyphia back in 2017, it's just I've had the relationship since, and have just anytime something new comes out or we're working on anything new with the solo stuff, I'm like, hey, we got this, and we're working on something right now. Like I do have a couple more so so solo songs. Like one's all pretty much finished. Um, just waiting on uh, like the guest people that are on it and uh i might trim it up a little bit too to make more sense because you know that's another thing that i've sat on it for a couple months like i go back and listen to it i'm like ah maybe there's something i could do better here make some something a little more cohesive like structure wise essentially um but yeah japan's sick i love japan i want to go back Dude, it's it's amazing yeah. best best place to tour on the planet i think yeah it's awesome like i, I want to be able to take like a proper like vacation over there for like an extended period <clears throat> i just went there for a week on an actual vacation first vacation oh, nice. i've taken in five years but like uh, yeah i took my girlfriend there for a birthday and uh it was fucking cool yep. like I, i've been there i've been there several times mostly for work which mm -hmm. is also awesome but uh it was cool just being a tourist yeah uh, we got to do, do that, that for like one, like a couple days after the Loud Park show. We, um, my girlfriend and uh, my sound guy, we took the bullet train over to Osaka and went to Universal. Mm -hmm. I got to go to actually like see that that Super Nintendo World first before any of the ones uh, over here in America, and that was a good move. I'm glad I did that because that one's better. <laughs> <laughs> I we I wanted to do that. There was just no time, yeah. but man, Japan. They they understand something mm -hmm. that I feel like no place else understands about how to do things. I don't know how to explain it, but they have their shit together. Yes, they do. They, I remember like, the first time I went over there, that 2017, when I had like a little wrapper or something I was trying to throw away, and I was walking around, I was like, no trash cans. But there's also no trash. Yeah. Like anywhere. I was like, where do you throw... Like, where do you throw stuff away? Like, I literally, like, it wasn't anything significant. It was maybe like a napkin or like a wrapper of something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I just couldn't find anywhere to throw it away. But then that's when I started noticing. I was like, there's like no trash cans, but there's also no trash, which is the exact opposite of America. There's trash cans everywhere, but then there's also trash everywhere, at least out here <laughs> where I live in LA. Every, I think that's everywhere. I'm pretty sure that's uh, everywhere in America. Every big city. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we when we once we were playing there man and we you know we were using obviously a rented backline 
and that was before I had like uh you know before you brought your your amp in a rack yeah. um so it was uh it was I think I was using like a dual rack or something and um I think a fuse blue or something like that like literally one hour before showtime and or two hours before showtime and they had someone drive like somehow they weren't even worried they they had some service that just delivered it in a van right on time and they like fixed everything it's just the kind of thing like if that had happened at a u.s club would be like scrambling to borrow gear from another band or yep. like figure something out but they just little it's the little things like that mm-hmm. that they just have they just have shit figured out. So yeah, the public transit, like even I was able to figure out, or us three were able to figure out how to navigate the tram system there. Like, every, yeah, yeah, like it's so intuitive and just like makes sense. And it's also clean too. That's the other thing. Like all their public transit is like very streamlined and like you're not like like if I was in New York personally, like um, no hate, like no hate to any New Yorkans or whatever like we I have tons of friends but I don't like New York I don't like going there it's chaos and like the traffic there is worse than LA where I live like every single time I go over there it's like ten, the traffic's so much worse than even over here and it's just like like I wouldn't step foot in one of those subways like ever like they're disgusting like they're yeah, absolutely yeah. vile but, probably a good idea <laughs> yeah like I would like I don't care if they're convenient or like to an extent, but I have no desire to ever step foot in a New York subway (laughs) once in my life. But then I go to places like Thailand and Japan and stuff like that. And it's like, they're, I don't don't get it. I don't know why. Well, I mean, I do kind of know why that America hasn't, it refuses to like actually make public transit like acceptable, but that's like a whole deeper political rabbit hole that I don't want to go down. But yeah, we, we, don't, yeah, we don't need to go down there. Time, we don't need but, to do that. But but, but but we can definitely <laughs> agree that Japan have their shit together in ways yes. that no place else on earth does. Yep. So that's the point question, of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Question from Vitor Mireles, which is you are known for using very light strings and very low tuning. How do you keep them from going sharp when you pick and how hard slash soft do you pick? Uh, and do you have any picking well, tips to improve tone? Let's let's focus on, since he asked a bunch of shit, let's focus on the light strings, low tuning, keeping it in tune. What do you define as light strings, Ale? Because I feel like he's got that a little misconstrued. I define light strings as like eights. Yeah, I don't use eights. Okay, what do you use? Uh, I use nine and a halfs in standard tuning. That's pretty normal. Yeah, and then a step down from that, I go up to 11s. Okay, that's not... I mean, so, (laughs) you know, okay, so you know what I think is going on? Yeah, I mean, the low strings are, like, I fucking hate it when, like, the string is so thick, it, like, breaks your nut, or you have to file it down. Like, if someone's using, like, a 70 and drop A, like, no. Absolutely not. Like, never do that. That's going to sound like shit. Because the string is just so thick, it can't even like resonate. It like sounds like dead out the pack, in my opinion. Um, I'm with you. Yeah. So I'm with you on that. The lighter the string is, like the more note and like actual like pop and like presence it's going to have, like actual like a little more treble clarity in there. And you need that for those lower notes because like it's a super low note. So you need like the actual note aspect. To pop out more and that's going to be easier to achieve with a slightly lighter gauge and so yeah. like for like drop g for example like seven string g d g c f a d like i'll use a 58 on that on my on mine on my guitars and then uh for like my eight strings that i have the couple majesty ones i think i use either a 68 or a 70 for the low one but you know but that's going down to like in e so, okay, so I need to ask you a fifty-eight on low G. That's so, awesome. How do you get away with no buzz? Like, do you have super high action or something? Uh, the music bands are just sick guitars, and then my techs just set it up. 
That's awesome. I would love to do that. I I think that I this whole that. thicker strings, better tone thing is a myth. Oh, yeah, it's straight bullshit. I've it's never done that bullshit. in my entire life, ever. I, I mean, I've tried it because, you know, someone said that I was like, this feels like shit. Like actual to play it feels yes. like shit and it doesn't sound better. I don't give it like it might be like, I mean, especially if you're recording, it's like you can, you know, record something as many times as you want and retune it like to get it, you know, a perfect take of it. But like, I mean, I mean, some people like, especially if they have like a not as good a guitar, like they'll literally like if they have, if the engineer has a good enough gear, like they'll be able to tell tell that the intonation of the guitar is off and it's not translating from like different aspects of the guitar and you can like tune the guitar to the chord to like make sure it's like perfectly in tune for that part. Yeah. Which I'm sure so, you've had to do. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was going to say, I so. think that what has a bigger influence on what people perceive as tone is going to be the the pick the thickness of the pick the material yes. of the pick mm -hmm. i um, literally have two right here just for different scenarios like i have like mine which is you know my signature jazz three and then i actually have um a topo chico one right here nice. that uh is very malleable but you know that's not going to sound anything like the other one like this no. one's for like if i wanted to like mic up like my acoustic or something like that for like an, a, a part or something like i'm going to use this pick for that yeah I'm absolutely gonna use my fingers because you know these obviously sound much different than a pick as well but i'm going to use this pick on an acoustic or something like that not this because this is going to sound dull and like rounded in comparison because of how thick it is yeah, it, exactly. I, I've got this for strummy stuff. Yeah. This for like fast stuff. Mm -hmm. This for chuggy stuff. And yeah. then different thicknesses too. I, I mean, I have a whole like pick store right here, yep. basically. It drastically changes the tone. Yeah. I, I think find a string gauge that you can play your ass off on. I think that's... That's the most important thing. You're going to sound best if you can play well. And yep. too thick, unless you're just a mutant. Too I think that's part of what helped me, though, when I was uh, first learning. And I didn't realize it, that that's what was happening at the time until much later. I just wanted to play um, every song off of Train of Thought from Dream Theater on the same guitar because there's like five tunings. Maybe mm -hmm. not five, but there's like... C standard, a seven string song, a D standard song, uh, an E flat standard song. So there's at least like four different tunings on that one album. And um, at the time, I only had, I think I had a Goth Black Gibson Les Ball, which was like 22 fret, six string. Um, and I just wanted to be able to play all those songs and hop between them without changing strings or stuff. So I just put 12s on there. So I would be like playing like. Oof. Yeah, well, I mean, C standard, like everything down two whole steps. Okay. Yeah, like for that tuning, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But to go up to E flat on 12s, like that's some Stevie Ray Vaughan shit. Like I, it <laughs> hurt, but I didn't realize it, that that's what I was doing at the time. So it kind of like unintentionally made my left hand better just because I just wanted to hop between all those songs. And my dad was like, you know, just try a thicker gauge string out. And then I just kind of like dealt with it. It's changing the tuning constantly, depending on what song I was wanted to learn at the time. Yeah, I, I mean that's kind of like swinging, you know, warming up for baseball with a weighted bat. True, basically. Yeah, it's a good analogy. Same same idea, I think. <laughs> um, all right, so last question here. This is from Christopher Jordan Boyd. Uh, he says tendonitis is something I have come face to face with more recently, as I've played guitar for twenty plus years. Do you have a go-to stretch routine or any other hand muscle care upkeep things that you use to maintain your high level of playing? Um, well, the best stretches and exercises are from that Petrucci DVD rock discipline. Those are like, those are definitely the best ones. Um, and whenever I remember to do those, I can tell a significant difference, like in how loose I am versus mm -hmm. like, just going in cold or just 
trying to warm up by like just playing the songs progressively. Um, but the only way to really get rid of that, like if it's bothering you, is to just stop playing for like a week or two, which sucks. But like I've had I've had to deal with like legit tendonitis twice in both arms, and um, it's been like ten years since it's like act like happened significantly because I kind of figured it out, and that's just it always seemed to happen when I was like working out consistently, touring working out consistently while touring video games signings like all of that like all like consistently all the time Mm -hmm. and that's like so much tendon use you know what i mean all of that combined like playing guitar the way that i do keep maintaining a regular workout schedule and then once i'm done with that for the day going and playing video games being oh yeah being on my phone yep like all that shit so it's just like a conscious effort to like try and balance it out or if it's like starting to hurt you know just take a break for as long as you can like i had to use like a brace at one point on a warped tour and like do signings where i would have like like the brace on and just had the pin in my hand kind of like that because it hurt too much to like grab it and write and i would Mm -hmm. just have to be like j r like and sign it with like my arm essentially (laughs) So it's did rough. you, so basically <clears throat> did you figure out like what, what amount of working out versus like what amount of video games, like you kind of figure out how to balance, balance it all out? Well, I honestly just haven't really been working out now. I've just been trying to like not I've just stop drinking this year. Uh, not that I had like a huge problem with it, but I just decided like, I'm just going to take the, a year off. I'm just going to take a break. Good, good um, decision. Good yeah. decision. No, no regrets. And it's actually been really easy. Um, so say that off with a sinus infection. So I was already on antibiotics for two weeks. So I was like, all right, I got a head start. Might as well just do it. That is never a bad decision. Yeah. So, yeah. um, I haven't drank it all this year and I've just been eating healthier. And so I haven't like, I've just lost weight just <laughs> even without working out. <laughs> yeah. Do you know Spiro to see us? Uh, not personally, but he's a nasty player. Oh yeah. He's, he's fucking mm-hmm. crazy. Uh, yep. but, uh, we've talked about this a lot. Like he thinks that his diet has a lot to do with his like propensity towards injury with guitar due to inflammation. Like mm-hmm. he can tell, like if he eats like shit, like he's his threshold to pain mm-hmm. is way lower with and he just gets a lot also his fatigue like mm-hmm. he fatigues his hands and tendons way more and when his diet is clean and uh whatever he defines as clean uh like it's not that he doesn't ever like get tired or anything but it's just you know the system runs better that's what it yep. is so, yep the, the system runs better yep 100% so, yeah, I mean, yeah, that could be some. The person that asked that question could be something to pay attention to for sure. I will say I've had it as well, tendonitis and stuff. Mm-hmm. The only thing that worked was stopping playing. Same. It was just taking a break until it yeah. dies d- dies back down, and then just listening to your body if you feel it happening. Like if you're practicing for like two hours, like there's a difference between like you know pushing through the pain and then like actually injuring yourself you know what i mean um so like like i remember the first time it happened to me i was trying to practice this like four note pentatonic string exercise i had found where it's like you know that's huge stretches like to play a pentatonic scale on one string so Mm -hmm. it'd be like 12 15 17 19 all so your hands like like you know like spread out and then the next string up would be like 12 14 17 19 so you have this like Oh God, big, bigger gap, like right there in the middle one. And I was just doing that like for 30, 40 minutes, at least probably. And I remember feeling it being like, oh, this is starting to hurt. And I was like, eh, I'll just keep going. And then the next day I woke up and like my whole arm was just like useless for the most part. So that was a lesson. It's like, if it's starting to like literally like hurt and you're not just like, you know, getting fatigued or burnt out should probably, you know, take that as a sign to like pump the brakes and go do something else or stretch, come back to it later. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, yeah. 
you you got to be able to spot the difference between I'm just like sore or fatigued mm -hmm. versus I'm actually hurting myself. Yep. But it feels very different. Like it does. Mm -hmm. It feels very very different. I uh, I don't know how to explain it other than the you know if you're lifting weights or running and it hurts the way it's supposed to like it hurts mm -hmm. but yeah it's not like sharp it doesn't feel like something's tearing yes like, mm -hmm. like when you're hurting yourself with guitar like you can feel like some it, it feels like something's break like breaking like in your hands wrong yeah. yeah it's yeah it's a different kind of ache that's for sure and I'm like saying, I can't like exactly pinpoint it, but I've definitely learned what it is now, like through experience after, you know, dealing with it a couple of times with both arms, but it usually is always paired when I'm like doing tons of other tendon heavy activities <laughs> too. That's, <clears throat> that's a really good point. Yeah. I will say this. I don't know in like our circle, we know all or lots of the same people. I don't know a single person that's serious about this who has not dealt with this problem. Yep. It, I, and I feel like if they say they haven't, then they're probably either like a genetic freak or they're lying because everyone I know has dealt with this. Uh, I mean, do you know anyone who, who's serious who hasn't in some way, shape or form had to confront this? They're every single one. Yeah. It's, Even it's JP, fun. we've had conversations about it. Like, it's, happened, it, it's a thing that it's you have thing. to be conscious of. Yeah. Like, uh, even, so, like, just for, uh, I mean, if you guys are recording yourself and stuff like that, like, even, like, it comes down to, like, what mouse you're using and shit like that. I remember that was a big one for me. And at that time, I'm talking when I had the 10 nice, but I was using one of those stupid magic mouses. Like, I hate them. They would have my hand, like, in this position. Like just to hold it. Oh yeah. Move around all because you know, you gotta hold the mouse, move it around. That would be like these two. And then you're scrolling with just this one finger up and down. And like look at like just how awkward that is and how much like I can even feel it like right in here. So like if you're going back recording and you're using like a bad mouse that's not ergonomic and you're doing that all the time, like that's just gonna eat up your right hand. So like I even have this like gel pad to like keep my wrist straight. I use the the Kensington Slim Blade, you know, the the round, like this uh -huh. guy, because it's so much more ergonomic and I can work for hours, yep, without any fatigue, like, whatsoever um, in that aspect. So, like, even things like that, you have to pay attention to to make sure that you're not crap, like, overusing everything all, all the time. Scrolling <clears throat> on your phone, if you use one-handed? Mm-hmm. If you have like one of those bigger iPhones or something, that's what I got. The, the yeah. 15 max. <laughs> Dude, I have noticed <laughs> if I do, if I go one handed with it. Oh yeah. Like I, it, it contributes, it contributes to the problem. Mm -hmm. I have like a dent in my pinky kind of, you see that? Yes. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like <laughs> literally from holding it like that. And sometimes I'll be like, nope, do that instead. Don't. Yep constantly support it or I'll try to get like my whole finger on it and not just like the one little divot that's right there and like I've, it's literally like a thing it's like phone pinky like look at my hand yeah <laughs> it's a it, it's a thing you gotta yeah. be careful yeah so question from Radislav I'm not gonna ask the whole question it's a lot of shit uh, so <laughs> What do you think is most worthy of practicing when you really want to one unlock the fretboard to play all the stuff you want when it comes to lead playing and three compose with those skills in mind and compose originally. Um, and he said, for reference, I can sweep minor, major diminished arpeggios of all inversions and triplets at about 170. Uh, I could do scale stuff with all of the modes of major and alternate pick that as you know, around 180 to 220, I could do all seventh chords in their inversions. So what do you think? So I guess he knows his basics. So what do you think? Sounds like he knows his basics and he's proficient at them. So mm -hmm. what do you think are the best next steps? What to focus on uh, in those areas and overall process would you take to be more free at playing the instrument? Stop caring about theory. Yep. 
<laughs> the, just to put it blunt, stop giving a shit about what everything's called. Now that you know what, now that you know all that stuff, just write what sounds good. Like if it sounds good, sick. Worry about what it's called later. Like I remember once I started made once I made that disconnect and stopped being so obsessed because it's music theory, it's not music law. So it's just there to help, you know, expedite things. That's that's the best way I'll explain it. It's like you already kind of have an idea of what's going to work better with something else. There's a lot mm-hmm. less trial and error and hunting. Like, you know, like, okay, it's like if you're writing a solo and it's like, all right, cool. Like, I want to harmonize this arpeggio. I'm going to play one inversion up and then I got that version of a harmony if I yep. want to do it or like a shred run. Cool. I'm shredding something in Ionian. I want to harmonize this. Dope. I'm going to play something in Phrygian over top of it. Uh, it Like things like that. Like you don't have to be like so obsessed over what everything's called and just because now that you know all that, like that's what Al Di Miola said at that one Petrucci camp. Uh, I think it was the second or third Petrucci camp. He just put it that bluntly. He's like, learn as much theory as you possibly can and then forget all of it. Because it's still back there. Like you learned all of it, it's still up there. You just don't have to be like so hyper focused on it. You know, I feel like people approach guitar exercises the same way. They approach guitar exercises as if they're music, as if mm-hmm. they're like actual music you're trying to learn instead of just like a way to get better technique. And I feel like they approach theory, like you said, like law. Mm-hmm. Yep. It, Literally, once I made yeah. that disconnect and just kind of like started playing with different ideas in my head, that's when I started making some of the best shit. Like the earliest example I can remember of when it comes to writing um, like that is the Fall of the Sign solo that I wrote. Like I literally wrote the first version of that when I was like 15, I think. It was for my local band, uh, the very first version of that. And it stayed perfectly in key, like straight diatonic, like didn't divert from its original scale at all. It kind of sounded like a pop chord progression you know like, you know one six four five uh pop progression mm-hmm. and um one day i just had the idea i was like i wonder what this would sound like if i just made every chord minor instead and then that's the version that ended up getting released and as soon as i had that idea pop in my head i was like you know fuck it staying in the same key the whole time like that's kind of like i mean it's cool it's the part was fine like beforehand but once i was there like oh i wonder what this would sound like just Instead of staying in key with itself the whole time, just make every chord a minor chord, regardless, and then technically, you know, changing keys every arpeggio part. But I mean, every chunk of it is would technically, if you were to write it down, it would be, you know, changing keys. But I wasn't worried about it at the time. So just did it. And then it ended up sounding way cooler. And I was like, all right, dope. That and idea can, worked. And you can still use your theory knowledge even when you're doing stuff like that. Like you said, like if you're writing an arpeggio to that part and you want to add, harmonize it. You still mm-hmm. know how to get the next inversion or yep. the next two inversions. Like it, it still helps inform good decisions, but uh, you're not married to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just helps things go faster. Like as opposed to someone who just like you know they learned in arpeggio, like you know the default five string one. Uh, I think it's the second inversion of it, um, or it would start like fourteenth on the low A string, and then. 19 and then it's the one that looks like this like the do, 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 if yeah yeah you 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 know what i'm talking about but yeah. um like that's like one of the first ones every everyone always learns so it's like there's a big difference between just like looking up an arpeggio tab online and then knowing like hey if i play this one if i go down to the first inversion of it i have a lower harmony if i go up one more then i have the root version of it and then that's also a harmony of it also versus just like doing a straight third which is going to sound completely different too because you're not getting that fourth interval in there uh, of the harmony of that. So it's like, there is a lot to it, but yeah, it's like, once you learn all of it, stop caring about it. It's all up there. You're still going to use it, but you're going to make right cooler stuff because you're less married to like what it's should be than not like what it could be. If that makes sense. Man, sometimes I get asked questions about like cool people, riffs that people think are cool or parts I wrote that people think are cool. And then they'll give me a theoretical analysis and be like, so were you thinking of like this going into this? Cause that's a really unique way of using this the concept is like, no, <laughs> no, 
it sounded sick. That's it. Yep. There was mm-hmm. zero theory being thought of. Yep. Yep. Hopefully why, that answers his question. That, that there was one? a lot of meat on that one. So why is it so difficult for people to make that disconnect? That I don't understand. Well, it's definitely. I remember when it happened for me. Like it was like an epiphany where I was just like, "Oh yeah." Well, I mean, I feel like as you get so excited about it at first because you're learning a lot and like you're starting to understand all of this stuff better. Because mm-hmm. I mean, it's literally like a language. Like you can't yeah. just say like Dorian and people like if you had, didn't learn your modes and even like look at it on a piano or something like that. It's like you're not going to fully understand what that is. And like, but you have to get to that point though where. Like, if you just say that term, then you know every single thing about it. Like, you know what its chord properties are, like where the the different inter- scale intervals are. Like, Dorian, you know, flat three, flat seven. But it's got that, that's like that parallel, uh, not parallel, the movement between like one to four would be like minor to major, which gives it that kind of like big, huge, like Lord of the Rings, like triumphant kind of sound. Um like as soon as you say like you got to know all those connotations about it and that doesn't happen without practice and ear training and things like that but like i said like i did all of that but that was because it was still new at the time and i was super excited about it but now that i've known that for so long all of those things it's just up there and i'm not like hyper focused on it anymore it happens in time i would so but i I guess you do have to be making an effort to to just write stuff that you think is cool yep regardless yep i that's what i do now just worry about what it's called later when i gotta go transcribe it Mm -hmm. makes sense i think that's a great answer um let me see here uh now actually the last question nice is from vitor which is your playing is unbelievably clean could you explain your right and left hand muting technique do you usually palm mute little low strings when doing um Fast scale runs or arpeggios. I, I think you meant fast scale runs or arpeggios. They could be fat. Yeah, fat and fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there is a diff difference between palm muting and muting with your palm. Um, I know that sounds probably stupid when I just say it like that, but I do tend to notice um now at least i'm not like hyper focused on it anymore but i have noticed through like you know transcribing my stuff and things like that i always tend to mute, palm mute um with leads like the wound strings more so mm-hmm. like i kind of like the default towards that like even like a playing in arpeggio unless i'm like consciously intending on not having any part of it palm muted um uh it's usually if it's on the bridge pickup I'll palm mute, like the all always palm mute the wound strings for a lead part. Uh, but again, that's not every time. It's it's all that stuff is so subjective. Um, there's no right or wrong answer to any of it. You just kind of got to f- find what works best for you as a player. But um, when it comes to actually muting, though, like you know, like keeping the strings quiet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my palm is like right behind every single string that I'm playing. That's just how my technique is adapted. I don't even have to think about it anymore. Palm is just immediately right there, even with arpeggios. Like, like you could literally strum the strings on the first fret of my guitar while I'm playing, and nothing would be coming out besides what I'm intending to play. It's just got to get to that point. Like that, my teacher would do that to me, uh, Matt Mills. Like he would literally do that. Like while I was practicing, he would go like, "Are you muting correctly?" And then like start strumming on the first fret while I'm playing. <laughs> You would only yeah. hear like plink, 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 like from him doing that. There'd be no open strings or anything like that. What about um, if you're playing something, like if you're playing in the middle strings, obviously you're muting with a, the lower strings with your palm. What about the upper strings? It's your left hand. You just got to keep your thumb down. Mm-hmm. You can't do it properly if your thumb is like way over the back of the neck because then you get like the tunnel like your fingers curl up kind yes. of because they can't be flush on the upper strings just because of the way your hand is resting on the neck. So yeah, as long as your thumb is down low enough, your thumb is down lower, you can keep these fingers more flat and up on the upper strings that you're not using. Yeah, obviously you got to be good places to practice that is around like fifth, seventh and 12th fret because there's natural harmonics there. 
So if you're not doing it right, you'll act, you'll hear like slight overtones unintentionally. Like you might get like sympathetic resonance or something like that from like, if you're actually playing a G or something like that on the lower strings and your hand, you're not pressing down low enough and you're around the 12th fret and you're muting the higher, like the actual G string, like you might accidentally get like, you know, like a sympathetic resonance within the guitar. Yes things like that because it's the same note so it might it might accidentally trigger that if you're not muting it correctly it gets to that I, point where you have to start paying to like paying attention to like these little tiny subtleties like this in order to break past whatever barrier you're at to like keep improving we have some really good exercises for that on on the riff Hard site so uh if you look at the richard shaw i i had to i wanted to load it up just so i could be really specific so richard shaw's uh lessons he has one on fret hand muting um and there are lots of exercises like the one that you just mentioned mm -hmm. where like he'll you'll play like the fifth fret on the lowest string yeah but you're strumming mm -hmm. and the only thing you should be hearing is the note on the fifth fret for instance yep. you know th those types of exercises um they're very very useful uh, and I just want to confirm that my memory is not shot, but, uh, it, because I feel like, uh, Mike Stringer also covered this. Um, oh yeah, it gets even worse on eight strings. You have yeah. To, Cause you have uh, more area to cover. Yeah. I, I'm not fine. Okay. In Mike Stringer's, uh, yeah. Okay. So. In Mike Stringer's um, picking hand techniques lessons, uh, there's a pressure and muting section, which is really, really good. It's all this stuff for like playing on low chords on on extended range guitars and stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've uh, even noticed yeah. for like muting on an eight string, like I get up into like this territory to like keep the low strings muted. Mm -hmm. Like I'm literally like using my wrist to keep the low strings muted. Like if I'm playing on the higher strings, like it just gets down that far to where it's, you literally have to have like this on the low, the low, two lowest strings just because of how wide it is. Like it just, just gets to that point where if you're not doing that, then they're just gonna, you're just gonna have this ominous like oh, in the background while you're playing, which doesn't sound good. No. Yeah. You just gotta mute by any means necessary. Like yep. that's, that's all there is to it. Yep kind of hard to explain over podcast but i'm pretty sure even in my course i think we talked about yeah some of that stuff like how to like how i hold my pick and all that shit i think we did yeah, yeah. it's I, so i would look at jason's classes and if you want like just really specific exercises the richard shaw stuff is like an entire section dedicated to like this shit we're talking about and they're not the most exciting exercises on earth like you're not going to feel cool doing them, but you're going to sound a hundred times better if you get good at them. Yep. So. Yep. Cool. Agreed. Well, Jason, thank you. Yeah, man. Been a pleasure as always. Hell yeah.